So welcome to the uh, next installment of our Mitim Farshim class. We've done Sadia Gaon. Last week we did one of my favorites, Rashi. And tonight we have Ibn Ezra, as we shall find. He was a fascinating, colorful, um, multifaceted uh, personality whose influence on Jewish life and especially Torah interpretation is uh, profound, as we shall see. Uh, also, I want to dedicate this uh, shiur as in the past to the memory of the parents of David Barry, our good friend who is behind the camera. Uh, um, that's Mordechai ben Harav Menachem Mendel and Liebe Bas Abba, and also uh, David's uh, father in law, Shmuel ben David, uh, all of them Alehim Hashalom. Uh, also, one last advertisement uh, make your plans to enjoy, indulge this uh, shiur with us. It's happening at uh, Kesher starting uh, late uh, on Saturday evening. We've got outstanding program, so take all the info with you on your way home. And uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, as I said, our subject tonight is uh, Ibn Ezra, and I hope that you have the sheet uh, in front of you. Uh, Ibn Ezra was born, it says here in Toledo, Toledo, it's not really so, he's really born in Tudela, but they are often uh, confused because of the similarity of the, of the names. Um, he was born in Tudela in Spain in 1089 or 1090, we're not exactly certain, and actually he describes himself as being a native of Cordova, uh, and it seems that's where he grew up, although he was born evidently in Tudela. Uh, he died in an uncertain location. We don't know where he was buried, where he is buried, whether Spain or Rome or London or even the Galil in the land of Israel. All of these have been suggested and postulated, but there is no uh, really uh, corroborating evidence for any of them. But as we shall see, he definitely lived in all of those. Well, we don't know for sure about the land of Israel, but he definitely, definitely lived and visited all of those places. As we shall see, he's popularly referred to as uh, Ibn Ezra. His real name was Rabbi Avraham ben Meir Ibn Ezra. Ibn Ezra um, means the son of Ezra. His father was not Ezra. That may have been an ancestor. The family was known as the Ibn Ezra family. And uh, uh, Errol, do you mind giving Nurida one of the handouts there? No, no, you don't have to give, me, you don't have to give me yours. You can give her that one there, just here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, his his father was named uh, Mayor, and there are actually other members of the Ibn Ezra family who are also well known. He had, I think, a cousin or nephew called Moshe Ibn Ezra, uh, who was a great, uh, renowned as a great poet. And as we shall see, he did have a son called Isaac Yitzchak uh, ben Abraham Ibn Ezra as well. Uh, he is renowned as a Torah commentator, as a grammarian, as a philosopher, and as a poet. He also traveled very widely. Again, we'll, we'll soon uh, get to that. Actually, I'll just point out his commentary. The image that you see on the page you have in your hands is the, uh, an image from the classic Mikraus Gedolos, that is to say the publication of the Chumash with a range of commentaries of which Ibn Ezra is featured uh, always in a prominent way. And that is true in the more recent editions of the Mikraus Gedolos as well. Uh, in fact, the first edition of Ibn Ezra's commentary on the Torah was published in 1488 uh, in Naples. And uh, in that sense, it was one of the early Hebrew books that was published um, you know, in the sort of very first uh, generation. I mean, the first Hebrew book altogether was published, if you remember from last week, in uh, Regia de Calabrea in Italy in 1475. That was Rashi's commentary. So already only 13 years later, Ibn Ezra's commentary was published and has been the subject of up to 50 super commentaries, many of which are still in manuscript. Um, whereas Rashi, the commentaries on Rashi were, of course, a reflection of Rashi's popularity. In some cases, the commentaries on Ibn Ezra reflect the popularity and the esteem, but also the complexity of it and maybe the difficulty in understanding it. And many have uh, contributed their efforts to uh, gain greater insight or even explaining the meaning of Ibn Ezra's comments. And we'll see why that may be in due course. It's, it's, the date of publication was quite a few hundred years after he died, um, the first. So 
The question is, of course, can you be so sure that they are exactly his commentaries and they haven't been in any way? Uh, that's a good question. I think there's good reason to, to believe they were because he was very popular, very well known, and he traveled very widely. So actually we have quite a few manuscripts of his commentaries. Uh, many of his books, according to one source, he wrote as many as 108 different books. Uh, many of which uh, have not been published uh, and are still in manuscript, some of which may have been lost. But he traveled very widely, we'll soon see why, and uh, he was always greeted with great uh, honor and respect. His renown preceded him, and he would usually um, like uh, win the favor and the patronage of a wealthy uh, local person who would pay him to write a commentary or a book or something, he would stay for a few months, however long it took him to write it. And then the, comment, the, the manuscript would stay there with the patron, and in many cases, copies would be made. So um, I think there's good reason to believe it. Now, in some cases, he wrote more than one version. The, most, uh, class, the classic example of that is his commentary on the book of Exodus. His commentary on Shmos is much longer than his commentary on the other books of the Torah. Uh, this volume that I'm holding says base volume 2 is Shmos. The Ibn Ezra al Torah is published by Mosad Rav Kook in three volumes. The first volume is Bereshis, the second is Shmos, and the third volume has all the other three books uh, combined. So uh, Shmos is by far the, the most extensive and exists in two versions, a long version and a short version as well. So uh, the answer to your observation, Daniel, is that um, uh, in some cases, there were maybe different versions, there are different versions, but uh, there's good reason to believe it's authentic. Um, of course, the reason it was only published hundreds of years after his death is that the printing press was only invented a few hundred years after his, his death. Uh, okay, he also wrote about mathematics, also astronomy, also astrology, in which, uh, in which he believed. He was also a physician, so he wrote, in a, he was a polymath, a man of multiple talents and intellectual, broad intellectual interests and, and horizons. Uh, so let's uh, see the short bio here and we'll expand upon it. Ibn Ezra spent his youth in Cordova, Spain, where he received his Torah education. His entire life was one of poverty and misfortune. Commenting on his tragic life, he once said, if I were a candle maker, the sun would shine day and night. If I sold shrouds for the dead, no one would die. <laughs> He said, like, I had the anti-Midas touch, and uh, whatever I turn my attention to was, is doomed. <laughs> and yet, it's interesting that uh, we don't find bitterness or, like, a kind of complaining in his comments, and in his, even in his poetry, which, you know, are often quite personal in nature, in the nature of poetry. Uh, he reflects in a more, like, uh, ironic way, like in this, uh, these short lines here. Um, he wrote at the end of his life, he died at the age of 75, and although we don't know where he died, but he wrote on the day of his death, apparently, Va'avraham ben chamesh shanim b'shivim shana, and Abraham was 75 years old, b'tseito mecharon af ha'olam, when he left the wrath of the world. Now that's a pun, because the Pesach says about Avraham Avinu, he was 75 years old when he left Haran, so he says about himself, I'm 75 years old when I leave Haron, the, the wrath of the world, meaning the world has been angry with me and I've suffered terrible misfortune and uh, I'm on my way to a better world at the age of 75. Um, he, let me just tell you a little bit about why he was so, had such, in what way we say he had such mis misfortune. Uh, it seems his wife predeceased him by many years he had evidently four children, no, five sons, four of whom died in uh, maybe childhood or youth. The one surviving one was called Isaac Yitzchak, and he converted to Islam. And he was a poet, a talented poet. He went to Baghdad when he had the where he had the patronage of a certain Jewish uh, wealthy man. And when that patron converted to Islam, so he did as well. Ibn Ezra was on the other side of the world at that time, maybe in uh, France, maybe in England even, uh, as we shall see. And um, when he found out about it, some time later, he took it very badly. And a number of poems that he wrote 
reflect that. It's been suggested it possibly contributed to his demise as well. Uh, there is some reason to believe, although it's not definitive, that he traveled to Baghdad as well to try to win his son back. His son said that he never really left Judaism, he really practiced it in his heart, and uh, he only like uh, uh, professed or acknowledged the greatness of the Prophet Muhammad under duress. And the Rambam actually writes that a person is allowed to do that under extreme duress, which is not the same for Christianity, but for Islam one may. But these are, I would say, cold comfort for Abraham ibn Ezra, for the father, uh, to, to know, to know uh, those you know, considerations. Um, and from around 1140, he lived the life of the itinerant scholar. And uh, he went for, he was forced out of Spain, maybe because of the Almohadas uh, uh, Alma were a bit later, but one of the waves of Islamic uh, fundamentalists in 1135. And he made his way to Rome, where he lived for a number of years, and he wandered throughout Italy, and subsequently to Provence, to Ashkenaz, to, to, to Germany, to France, and he came to England as well, to London also. He did not like the weather in London. He comments on the plague of darkness. Uh, he says that uh, uh, sometimes, he said, the fog can be so thick that you can hardly move, you can't even see anything. He said, I've been there many times. He said, I've seen that on the Atlantic. Probably he meant the, uh, the English Channel, crossing to the English Channel. So he wasn't very impressed with the weather uh, here in London. Uh, he uh, established a close friendship with Yehuda Halevi, and we're going to speak about Yehuda Halevi actually next week. In fact, that's why I've decided to do Ibn Ezra today, because I want to do him you know, back to back with Yehuda Halevi, the famous uh, poet and uh, philosopher. The reason I didn't do Yehuda Halevi first, who is a few years older than Ibn Ezra, is I wanted to juxtapose Rashi and Ibn Ezra, who are two great, great Torah commentaries, of course. Uh, so he became close, a close friend of Yehuda Halevi. Uh, he met him in Cordova. They traveled together and separately as well. Uh, Yehuda Halevi also traveled widely, although only within Spain. Um, and uh, there is a legend, which again, we don't have proof for it, but it's not inconceivable that Yehuda Halevi may have married, I'm sorry, Ibn Ezra may have remarried the daughter of Yehuda Halevi. Um, but there's no evidence to, co to corroborate that. But there is a lot of evidence of their friendship, including in his own commentary, in Ibn, Eb in Ibn Ezra's commentary on the Torah. He cites Yehuda Halevi, questions that he asked Yehuda Halevi, the answers Yehuda Halevi gave, and he analyzes it and elaborates upon it. One famous example of that is on the Ten Commandments, which is apropos to Shavuot, of course, where he asked Yehuda Halevi the question, why does the God introduce himself to the Jewish people by saying, I am the one who took you out of the land of Egypt. Why not say, I am the one who created heaven and earth? It's a more impressive accomplishment and a more fundamental, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, description of, of the greatness of God. Anyway, I'll leave the answer for another time. But uh, So he has frequent, uh, quite a few examples of his uh, discussions with Yehuda Halevi. In 1135, Ibn Ezra was forced to flee to Rome, as we mentioned. There he composed his Bible commentary. Later he traveled to Provence, London, back to Provence and to many other places. Some say he journeyed to Eretz Israel and that he died there. Uh, he met Rabbeinu Tam, the famous Tosafist, the grandson of Rashi. Uh, and uh, he is quoted in Tosfas on Masaf the Rosh Hashanah, where um, there is a, uh, a sort of question that he asked Rabbeinu Tam, which is recorded there in, uh, in Tosos. We find it one other place as well. I've got it in my notes. Uh, in 1158, he visited London. And in London, he wrote a book called Yesod Mora. And he also wrote a very interesting book called Igeret HaShabbat, The Letter of Shabbat. Now, I bought this little pamphlet uh, on the street of Jerusalem, I think I paid like a uh, shekel for it or something like that. Otherwise, it would have just gone, you know, well, somebody salvaged it, thought he could turn a few shkalim by selling it to me, which he did. Uh, it's a little pamphlet published in 1959. It's the laws of Hadlakat Hanerot on Erev Shabbos and has a few other things here as well. What 
interested me is Igeret Shishalach HaShabbat LeRabbeinu Ibn Ezra, known as Igeret HaShabbat, the letter that Shabbat sent to Ibn Ezra. And actually, it doesn't have the whole letter here, but it has the introduction, which is fascinating. I reread it again last night in preparation for our discussion today. And I'll just read you a little bit how it begins. Ani Shabbat Ateret Dat Karim. Rivi'it ba seret hadvarim. I am uh, Shabbat, uh, the the crown of the precious faith, the fourth of the ten commandments. Uvein Hashem uvein banav ani ot between God and His children. I am a sign. Brito lam lechol dorot v'dorot, an eternal covenant for all generations. So, what's this about? Uh, after the poetic introduction, so he writes. Ibn Ezra writes. In, it says exactly when it was, on the 14th of Tevet, in the year of, uh, 1158. Um, I was uh, sleeping in my bed on a Friday night, and I was f fast asleep, and I had a dream. And uh, in my dream, Shabbat appeared to me. And essentially, I'm going to paraphrase now, essentially Shabbat said that uh, you are responsible, or you are like keeping the company of those who desecrate the Sabbath. And I said, what do you mean? I honor the Sabbath, I delight in the Sabbath, I anticipate the Sabbath. So uh, the Shabbat replied, there uh, is in your home a, a uh, document which seeks to violate the Sabbath. So I got very angry and I said, how could that be? A terrible thing in my house. They said, yes, your students brought you yesterday a commentary on the Torah. And in that commentary, it says that the Shabbat is observed from Saturday morning until Sunday morning. That's Shabbat, from, from when you wake up on Saturday morning until the 24 hours. And of course, this is not the case because Shabbat begins at sunset, as we know. Anyway, he uh, says he was going to, he, he went out by the moonlight and he read the book, the, the, the book that the Shabbat was telling him about. And he saw it and he was thinking he was going to tear his garment out, out of grief. Then he thought, I'm going to tear the book. Then he thought, no, because of the honor of Shabbat, I'm not going to do that because one is not allowed to tear these things on Shabbat. So I'm going to wait till after Shabbat. And then as soon as Shabbat ended, I picked up my pen and he wrote, and that's the rest of the Sigerat HaShabbat, in which he proves that this is a terrible error. Now, the interesting thing is, the one who writes something very similar to that is Rashbam. For those who were here last week, do you remember we said that Rashbam hews very uh, faithfully to the simple meaning of the text? Not like Rashi, his grandfather, who also follows the Pshat, but as we know, frequently adduces Midrashim as well. Rashbam doesn't do so. <coughs> Rashbam seems to interpret Vahi Erev, Vahi Volker, it was evening, it was morning, uh, along the lines that Ibn Ezra exoriates. And it's possibly for this reason that until recently, when Rashbam was printed in the Mikraot Gedolot, such as in the page that you have here, so if you look, you'll find there Rashbam. It's just in the left-hand column, slightly above Ibn Ezra. It says there Rashbam. So Rashbam is printed also in Mikraot Gedolot, but Rashbam on the first few chapters of the Torah is absent. And it could be that this is why because of this uh, quite controversial comment of Rashbam. But I'm digressing slightly, but this is how we know exactly when he was in London and where he wrote this uh, Igeret HaShabbat. Okay, the next short paragraph. His Bible commentary, which appears in all editions of Mikra Okudo, alone is one of the foremost classics of Torah exegesis. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about that commentary, which is, of course, the main contact that most Torah students will have with the teachings and the writings of Ibn Ezra. Although, as I've indicated, he wrote very widely on grammar, on all of the subjects I mentioned, astronomy, astrology, science, mathematics. Uh, he wrote much poetry, Shirei Kodesh, uh, sacred songs, also Shirei Chol, uh, secular uh, poetry as well, uh, he wrote. Um, and uh, many of his books have been published, but for the most part, the aspect of his literary output that we are most familiar with is his Torah, Torah commentary. So, 
You see here that the author of this little uh, brief, brief essay writes, in his commentary, Ibn Ezra follows the pshat, the interpretation according to the plain meaning, in preference to the agadic, homiletic, allegoric approach. And this frequently exposes Ibn Ezra to harsh criticism uh, from Ramban, from Abarbanel, from many others. Now, I have this book, which I bought years ago, called Pirkei Iyun B'machshevet Rabbi Abraham Ibn Ezra. Uh, chapters of uh, study in the thought of Abraham Ibn Ezra. It's written by a contemporary uh, scholar. Uh, I'm not sure if he's still living, but I think he was living when I bought this, which is about 35 years ago or so. And uh, he writes, uh, he has a few chapters, three, basically three chapters in this book. He has Ibn Ezra in the writings of Rabbi Yosef Kimchi, who was the father of Radak. We'll talk about him another time. Ibn Ezra in the writings of Ramban, of course, Ramban, very influential, and Ibn Ezra in the writings of Abarbanel. Now, Ramban frequently criticizes Ibn Ezra, very harshly at times. And very often, the criti crit criticism of Ramban against Ibn Ezra seems to be devastating, and you wonder how anyone could be vindicated in the face of such withering critique. And yet, the purpose of this book is to show that in, in er almost every case, there are grounds to actually... Um, Vindicate Ibn Ezra, and I'll give, just give you one small example. It says in Bereshi, in a, a portion of Noach, we meet a personality, mm -hmm. one of the villains of the Torah. His name was Nimrod. Nimrod. He was a king, and it seems that he was uh, possibly the one who was involved with the Migdal Babel, the Tower of Babel. And we know, according to the Medrash, he was the one with whom uh, Avraham Avinu came into uh, conflict. Anyway, he's one of the uh, villains of the Torah. And Rashi says that his name, Nimrod, comes from the word Mered. What is Mered? Rebellion. Rebellion, that's right. And he says, Rashi says, Yodes ribono umiskaben nimrod bo. He knows his master and he intends to rebel against him. He deliberately, uh, knowingly, wantonly rebels against him. That's Nimrod. And not only that, Himrid kol ha'olam, he got the whole world to kind of rally against God. He was an idolater. He tried to throw Avraham into the burning furnace and all of that. But Ibn Ezra doesn't see it that way. Ibn Ezra says, um, uh, Rabbi Avram Pirish, so Ramban quotes Ibn Ezra, Pirish Hefech Ha'inyan Alderch Pshuto. He turns the matter around according to the Pshat, according to the simple meaning. Kihu Nimrod, Hechaliot Gibor, Alachayot Letsudotam. The Pesach says that Nimrod was a Gibor Tsayid Lifnei Hashem. He was a great trapper before God. So Ibn Ezra says he trapped animals, uh, he hunted them, he trapped them. Lifnei Hashem, before God, what does it mean? He was a mighty hunter before God. Shahaya bone mizbachot, he would build an altar, uma'alebo hachayos la'ola lifnei Hashem, and he would bring the animals as a sacrifice to God. So he's turned Nimrod from a villain into a tzaddik. Says Ramban, ve'ein dvarav nirin, v'hinei hu matzdik rasha, he's vindicating a villain. Because our sages knew his wickedness through tradition. That's what Ramban says. So the author of this uh, book cites in the footnotes uh, some other commentaries who understand it like Ibn Ezra and even some Midrashim uh, which also would appear to support the view of, of Ibn Ezra. And just parenthetically, he quotes from one of the Achronim who says... Uh, about Ramban, that he does something similar, it's a good one, he does something similar regarding Lavan. But okay, I don't want to go off, off the, the, the track too much. He says basically Ramban also says something nice about Lavan, and we know in the Haggadah, Lavan, Bikesh, La Kares Hakol, he wanted to kill Yaakov, he was worse than Paro. So it's interesting, the, the author of this book finds that one of the Achronim, Rabbi Yaakov Mecklenburg in Ksava Kabbalah, 
critiques Ramban in a similar way for also like um, finding some nice things to say about Laban. So uh, Ibn Ezra often exposes himself, in, and that's only one of the minor examples, to quite severe criticism because he prefers the pshat. And he mentions that there are different approaches to the Torah, commentary, comment, commenting on the Torah, and in his introduction to his commentary, he has a fascinating uh, introduction. I think I mentioned already that many people don't bother to read the introductions to books, and somebody says it's like climbing through the window instead of going through the, the front door. When there's an introduction, the author has written the introduction for the benefit of his readers. So Ibn Ezra, in his introduction to his commentary, uh, establishes different approaches to the uh, Parshanut, and um, he says that uh, there are the anti-traditionalists who believe they can dispense with the explanations of the rabbis and feel free to interpret them according to their own reasoning. He doesn't like those, that approach. Those who believe that the Torah is entirely allegory and mysteries and should not be taken at face value at all. He doesn't agree with them. There are those who follow the Midrashim without regard to the plain meaning of the text, which he doesn't agree with that approach either. And he rejects all of these tendencies, and he says that his intention is to establish independently the literal meaning of the text, but following the explanation of the sages in interpreting the legislative parts of the Torah. Now, it may sound like a lot of long words there. What it means is that he says, when we want to understand what the Torah is telling us, we have to use seichel, insight, rational understanding, we have to use grammar, we have to be alert to the meaning of the words, to the context, and then we interpret it in the best way we can based on that. And that's why, like in the Nimrod example, where he looked at the context, said, Gibor Tzayid Lifnei Hashem, a great mighty hunter before God, well, he was a mighty hunter, and before God means he offered up sacrifices to God. That's how Ibn Ezra looks at it. But he makes an important provision, and that is when it comes to halacha, when it comes to passages which tell us about the in divine intent of how to keep the Torah, there we have to follow the tradition. There we have to defer to the teachings of the sages. And he does that consistently throughout his commentary. Now, it's interesting, and you're getting a bit controversial. Uh, Ibn Ezra is regarded by some secular uh, readers of the Torah as the father of uh, like uh, uh, biblical criticism. The first one who, like did not consider himself bound by the rabbinic tradition and respect for tradition, and he even in some passages seems to validate the idea of other hands involved in the writing of the Torah, other than Moshe. And there are a few verses which give rise to such a possibility, and in a cryptic way, he seems to allude to them. Now, he, I say seems because his language is often terse and elliptical and mysterious. He often deliberately almost teases his reader. He says, there's a secret, but I'm not going to tell you. Or he says, if you were very wise, then you would understand, but I'm not sure you are, so I wrote about it somewhere else, and this sort of thing. And um, he has a lot of wit, as we'll see some examples of that also. But he writes in such a way as to almost tantalize his reader. And Spinoza, the famous or infamous uh, Benedict Spinoza, uh, looked to Ibn Ezra as a kind of precedent for his views, which, as we know, were definitely uh, uh, heretical in terms of normative Judaism, and he was proclaimed as a heretic, and he was put into Cherim as a result. Um, and yet, the Chassam Sofer, the great uh, influential rabbinic authority in Preshburg in the early 19th century, uh, uh, the Chassam Sofer would sing one of Ibn Ezra's poems every Friday night, Sama Nafshi, My Soul Thirsts for God. This is one of the very beautiful, inspiring, profound, holy Zimirot. Chassam Sof would sing it every Friday night before Kiddush. Before Kiddush, he would first sing this Zemer of Ibn Ezra. You can find it in your Zimirot's book in, in many cases. Um, so, uh, and, and Chassam Sofer wrote about Ibn Ezra. He said, There's no doubt that the divine inspiration rested upon him when he composed this beautiful poem. So, 
uh, we find that on the one hand, uh, Ibn Ezra is uh, seized upon as a basis for those who seek to reject many fundamental features of our Torah understanding, and yet at the same time he is respected and admired. Uh, and part of the resolution to this apparent you know, um, contradiction or, or, or contrast is that Ibn Ezra distinguished between parshanut and halachic um, uh, veracity. When it comes to halacha, when it comes to the observance of the mitzvah, when it comes to interpreting the Torah in a, that tells us how to lead our lives, he has total deference for the sages. But he says there's a separate and distinct worthy enterprise and that is trying to understand the simple meaning of the text as best we can. Now, there's one group for which he has uh, no patience, uh, although he does spend a lot of time uh, uh, debunking them, and that is the Karaites. So I'll just give you a couple of examples of the Karaites, but let's just read a little bit further in our um, sort of meandering through this short biography, biographical sketch. In his commentary, Ibn Ezra follows the Pshat, we said that already, etc. Many of his comments deal with problems of grammar and syntax. They're written in a style that is extremely terse and often interspersed with obscure allusions. A great number of super commentaries have been written in Ibn Ezra's works, each attempting to shed light on the many obscure phrases. He fought valiantly for the purity of the Hebrew language and did not hesitate to criticize harshly any infraction of the rules of grammar or style he encountered. His caustic wit is apparent in many sarcastic comments with which he demolishes interpretations he considers incorrect. His commentary is studied by all serious students of the Tanakh. Now, uh, before we get to some examples in his Torah commentary, there is a famous passage of Ibn Ezra in one of the first commentaries that he wrote. He did not begin with Bereshit. The first commentary that he wrote in terms of his career, it would seem, I mean, he may have written private notes, probably he did on a lot, but the first one that he wrote as a sort of fully edited uh, book, or among the first, was Koheles. He wrote a commentary on Koheles. Yaakov, uh, uh, Dr. Schmidt, is expert on Koheles. So he wrote an, a commentary on Koheles, and he took the opportunity to criticize many poets, Hebrew poets, Paitanim, who indulge in very abstruse and very, uh, let's say, grammatically fanciful formulations that uh, are very difficult to understand, do terrible violence to the Hebrew language, and he is very critical of them. And you can find the beginning of chapter 5, Al Tivahel Al Picha, do not speak uh, impetuously. V'libcha al yimaher, in your heart should not be quick. Lohutzi davar lifnei ha'elohim, before God. Ki ha'elohim ba'shamayim, because God is in heaven. V'ata al ha'aretz, and you are on the earth. Al ken yud varecha ma'atim. Therefore your words should be few. So on that pasuk, he launches into a lengthy, uh, withering uh, critique of the, uh, the sins of the Paitanim. And, uh, however, he singles out, we mentioned this two weeks ago, Sade Gaon. Sade Gaon, he says, is okay. Uh, he's, he's on the ball, Sade Gaon. And it's interesting, among the books that Ibn Ezra wrote is a um, defense of Sade Gaon against the criticisms of a man called Dunash, Dunash ibn Labrat, who was also a great grammarian, who was a disciple of Sade Gaon, and then I would say he turned against his master, but he wrote a book critiquing Sade Gaon, this Dunash ibn Labrat. Ibn Ezra wrote a book defending Sade Gaon. He quotes Sade Gaon very frequently and generally with a lot of respect, well, always with respect. He frequently agrees with him, quite often he, he disagrees with him, but he definitely respects uh, uh, the Sade Gaon. Yeah. Can I ask, um, we see across the, the rabbinic commentaries like the Midrash and the Gemara a wide range of pshat, types of pshat. Some is sometimes say it's partial pshat, and other, other times it's much more homiletic. So when you say that Ibn Ezra is showing preference to pshat, I would assume that it's just a kind of a more like an academic preference rather than what's MS. Well, um, the idea of MS, of truth, when it comes to Torah interpretation, uh, is a multifaceted concept. Because as we know, 
kipatish if otsets sela as a hammer can splinter a rock and send sparks in all directions the torah can bear multiple legitimate interpretations so it doesn't mean that one is more truthful than another or one is closer to the to the ms uh, there can be or multiple interpretations, all of which are intended, all of which are part of the divine intent. Now, when it comes to halachic interpretation, there we are more limited. And as I said, Ibn Ezra will frequently suggest his like um, literary interpretation, but then he will defer to the rabbinic interpretation with regard to the definitive practice. By the way, Rashi is not that much different. Someone wrote a fascinating article years ago called Rashi Kefarshan, Shalo Aliba de Hilchasa, Rashi as a commentator, not in accordance with the halacha. Rashi will very often uh, interpret a pasuk quoting one of the sages in the Mishnah, for example, even though the halacha follows another sage in the Mishnah. But Rashi will choose the rabbinic opinion, which in his view is closer to the pshat even though the other opinion may be the opinion which is halakhically definitive. And Rashi doesn't dispute that, the two can coexist. So uh, one has to delve quite um, closely into the, the matter to distinguish like the different level, levels of pshat, the different types of, of pshat. So I know I'm using the word pshat very, um, I'm tossing it out a lot, uh, for the purposes of this here, which is a biography rather than a parshanut, we'll just leave it in the, in the un, un, uh, clarified, you know, uh, form. But I would like to share with you some examples because they're so delightful, although not to be on the receiving end of his barbs, um, regarding his comments about the Karaites. So he frequently will cite interpretations of the Karaites. There are some cases I've seen where he will actually validate their interpretation, but those are rare. Most of the time, he rejects it, sometimes in a, a very caustic manner. I'll give you an example. Um, it says in uh, Parshish Mishpatim, Ki gach shor ish es shor re'ehu. When the ox of a man gores the ox of the, f the friend of the man, meaning the ox of another man. So Reuven owns an, owns an ox, and Reuven's ox gores Shimon's ox. So the Torah says what payment has to be made. So Re'ehu, the friend, means the owner of this ox has a friend or, or a neighbor or even a stranger, and his ox gores the other ox. But he says like this, that Ben Buta, who was one of the Karaites, so he says that it means Re'ehu means the friend of the ox. So he says, Ve'ein l'shor re'ya el Ben Buta bilvad. He says, an ox doesn't have a friend, he said, except maybe Ben Buta is the friend of the ox. Uh, the Torah doesn't talk about, the, about friendship and you know, friendly societies among oxen. The, the friend means the friend of the person. Another example, he says, Ve'ene Leia Rakos. The eyes of Leia were rach. Now the word rach means tender. And Rashi says that her eyes were tender because she was crying. It's like her eyes were, were sensitive. And she was crying a lot. They were sensitive because of the crying. Why she was crying, Rashi has an explanation. It's not our concern at the moment. So he quotes Ben Ephraim, who's also one of the Karaites, who says that Ene uh, Leia Rakos, that Ben Ephraim says that it means Arukos. You have to add an Aleph, as if the word was not Rakos, Rach is tender, but Arukot. If you add an aleph before the word, then it's arukot, which means long, like, like uh, oriental eyes. Which could be because she was living close to the Orient, so maybe her eyes were, were like, uh, like slanted like that. I don't mean in a pejorative way. It has to be very careful. One must be careful with political uh, sensitivities. Arukos, uh, that's how her eyes were. So he says, Ibn Ezra says about this man, what was his name? Do you remember? Ben Ephraim. He says, Vuhu chaser aleph. He said, take away the Aleph from his name. If you take away the Aleph from Ephraim, Ben Ephraim, you have Ben Parim, son of, son of a bull. A par is a bull. Yeah, so you take away his Aleph. So he's caustic, he's sharp. But, but I want to tell you about one of the very interesting ones, because this has halachic implications as well, especially for those who are here uh, to Kesher, for we, uh, we gave a shir before Shachris on Shabbos a couple of weeks ago, 
I don't know, maybe Yosef is the one who was here then or maybe not. In any case, he uh, has some very interesting comments about the following uh, pasuk uh, in um, Kitisa. It says, Sheish uh, Yisamim Ta'avod, six days shall you work, of Yemai Shri Tishpost, and on the seventh day you shall rest. Becharish Uva Katsir Tishpost. In plowing and in harvesting you shall rest. Now, we know, of course, that Sabbath observance involves uh, 39 malachot. The Torah does not mention most of them explicitly. Only a few are mentioned explicitly, like fire is mentioned explicitly, and uh, a couple of others are mentioned explicitly. And here we have also two particular ones, charish plowing and harvesting. So we learn certain things from that. So Ibn Ezra says, he mentions a man called Anan. Now, I hope you remember who Anan was, because we mentioned him before. Anan ben David was the founder of the Karaite movement. Actually, we mentioned him in the Pirkei Avos here as well. His name came up. Anan ben David. So, it, remember the, the pasuk? It's, the words are, Becharishu v'katsir, in plowing and in harvesting. So, Ibn Ezra says, Shehem ikar chaye ha'adam. That's the, the essence of, that is the basis for life. In other words, uh, you need bread to, to eat, to, to live, and in order to grow the grain for the bread, you need to plow and you need to harvest. So it mentions plowing, which is the beginning of the agricultural process to produce a loaf of bread. It starts with plowing before planting, etc., and then the harvesting. So once you harvest the bread, the, the, the wheat, then you're, you're good to go because, okay, there's a lot more work still to be done. It says uh, uh, plowing and harvesting, and that's why the Torah mentions them. Amar Anan, but the uh, Karite says, and he adds, Yimche Shemo Anan. May his name be, may his name dissipate like a cloud. Anan is a cloud. So Anan says, and he adds on parenthetically, may his name dissipate like a cloud. Kize Amishkav Haisha. This is a euphemism for marital relations, plowing and uh, harvesting. He says, Vahalote chasehu busha. I mean, in other, according to Anand, you understand the implications that uh, marital relations are forbidden on Shabbos, according to the Karite interpretation. Vahalote chasehu busha, he should be covered with shame. Ki imam, possibly because he says, you know, his mind is uh, turning to uh, uh, ir irrelevant subjects, is not pertinent to this uh, pasuk. Vahalote chasehu busha, he should be covered with shame. If we say that it's within a man's power to bring about the plowing according to the euphemistic interpretation, when it comes to the word harvest, now it's a lovely pun. The plowing is within a person's control. Yacharish means he'll fall silent. He'll have to be silent when it comes to katsir. Katsir is harvesting. Because if we say harish is the conception, katsir is the, the childbirth. But a person has no means of determining when a baby will come into this world. Some people would like to have that option. Maybe now you can do cesareans, but uh, it can happen any day of the week at any time. So he says it's ridiculous to suggest that the Torah is saying, Bacharish of a Katsir. Maybe you can follow your interpretation of the Kharish, but the Katsir disproves your whole, your whole theory. Now, the reason I, I like this, I think it's significant, is that this has halakhic implications. Because, and I speculated about this when we had this year a couple of weeks ago, that I think that part of the reason that the sages have established the mitzvah of marital relations on Shabbos is to refute the Karaites. We see the Karaites believed it was forbidden, therefore the rabbis said, on the contrary, it's a mitzvah. The same is true for Shabbos candles, and the same is true for Sholem, hot food, that's right, it's the same as true. So I think, I haven't seen that explicitly, but that is my, my theory, and I was sort of alerted to it by this comment of, of Ibn Ezra. So you see his style, and you see the substance, how he's concerned with the matter of substance like this as well, because according to the Karaites, this is forbidden, and of course our tradition tells us something very different. Uh, there are a couple of other examples of his commentary here, but I just want to read you an example of his poetry as well. So I mentioned that he traveled widely, 
and uh, he had no family and he was literally the wandering uh, uh, scholar and he went from place to place. We find him in Lucca, in, in Italy, in many different places, Rome and, and elsewhere. And um, they say, and I'm, I don't know if this uh, story or this little poem is um, uh, verifiable, but anyway, I've got it, so I'm going to share it with you. Uh, he once was in a certain town, and there was a Gvir, a wealthy man, in that town he wanted to meet with him, probably wanted to offer his services, he was looking for a patron. He was penniless, I mean, he, he wore, went with his, the clothes on his back. Uh, so if he went to a town, he needed to find a patron there, someone who would, would help him out. So the wealthy man, he tried to meet with him. But whenever he went, the uh, household staff would show him the door before he even got to the door, you know, they'd send him packing. So he wrote a little poem, um, for the Hebraist here, you'll appreciate it. We can translate, of course, as well. He says, Ashkim levet hasar omrim kvar rachav. I, I got up early to the home of the, the Tsar, the great man, and they told me, Kvar Rachav, he's already ridden off on his steed. Avo le'et erev, I came to the evening, I came back in the evening, Omrim Kvar Shachav, he's already gone to bed. O Ya'ale Merkav, either he'll get up and, and rush off on a, on a steed, on a, on, a, you know, on a horse or in a carriage, O Ya'ale Mishkav, or he's going to get up onto his bed, and either way I can't see him. O yale ish ani no lad bli kochav. Woe to the unfortunate man, he means myself, who was born without a star. Meaning like I'm, I'm doomed to be unable even to, to meet with this, with this man. Uh, and we mentioned already about his, uh, his, uh, his, his dying you know, uh, words, that at the age of 75, so Abraham left haron af haolam, the, the, the anger of the world. Uh, and yet we don't find a bitterness, we find a wit, we find a humor, we find puns, and we find almost a, a, a delight with life and a fascination with life as well. Uh, like in that Igerita Shabbat, in the way that, that he wrote it in that, in that style. Um, and uh, there's another little pitgam which is attributed to Ibn Ezra, and I have seen him quoted in his name, whether he really wrote it, I can't say. He says, Ha'avar ayin, the past is gone. Hahove keheref ayin. The present passes like a, a, in the blink of an eye. Atid adayin. The future is still to come. Vahadaga minayin. So therefore, why worry? Because the past is gone. The, f the, the present is fleeting. It's gone in an instant. And the future is still to arrive. Adaga minayin. So why worry? So it's like a happy-go-lucky attitude. He was not happy-go-lucky, but he had that perspective at the same time. Trying to give uh, Yaakov one of those. Uh, well, do you have an extra one? You got one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. I've got a closing uh, comment, uh, uh, literary um, observation to share with you. But before we do that, let's take a look at the uh, passages that are here on your sheet. We've already uh, made reference to a few of our own. Um, so, here's an example where he speaks about Beit HaSohar, um, and he makes the following comment, Beit HaSohar, dungeon. I do not know if this is a Hebrew or Egyptian term. We find that uh, Sar Beit HaSohar, where uh, Yosef was interred, it was a dungeon, a prison. I do not know if this is a Hebrew or Egyptian term, because it is followed by its definition, because it says, Makom Asher Asirei HaMelech Asurim, the place where the king's servants are interred. So, but by the fact that the Torah explains the meaning, the implication is it might be an Egyptian word, which by itself is a kind of... Um, bold suggestion that the Torah is utilizing Egyptian words, by which the verse tells us what it is. This is analogous to achashtranim, a Persian word, which the text then explains as b'nei haramachim, swift steeds, bred of a mare. So if you just look in, in the upper right, which is the footnote, footnote number five on that, uh, at the end of that little passage, the verse states that Joseph was placed in Beit HaSoar. Other than this chapter, the term does not appear in the Bible. So, since it does not appear anywhere in the Torah, one can only understand it from the context, although the Torah itself explains the meaning, but it's not used anywhere else, which leads Ibn Ezra to suggest perhaps it's an Egyptian word. And here we see his interest in lexicography and etymology, which he writes about quite a lot. 
Um, and here the author, the editor, says it may be called a hapex legomenon, a ter the term used for a word that appears only once in scriptures. The first time it occurs in the present tense, in the present verse, it is followed by the clause, the place where the king's prisoners were kept. I think we explained that already. Okay, uh, take a look at the next one. It is he who sits above the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. This is a pasuk in Isaiah. So Ibn Ezra here uh, reflects his interest in or his knowledge of astronomy or astrology, albeit, of course, in a medieval way. I'm not saying he was working for NASA. Chug is a circle. Compare with Muchuga, the compass, the instrument that is used to draw a circle. Here it says that the earth is round and not square, although no verse is needed for the support of this statement. Now, Ibn Ezra was writing in the 12th century, long, long before Columbus, when actually it was widely believed that the earth was flat or square. Now, apparently, I did a bit of research, apparently the Chachamim knew the earth was round, but the man in the street did not know. And therefore, Ibn Ezra uh, points out that this verse in the prophet uh, suggests or, or you know, indicates that the world is round. Is known by convincing proofs. He who sits above the circle of the earth, he whose glory fills the entire earth. Um, yeah, so a lot of his astronomy and a lot of his mathematics, I can tell you now, is well beyond my understanding. Uh, this book, this critical edition, includes uh, sometimes quite extensive footnotes and even some drawings to try to help the reader understand what's going on. Um, and uh, in some cases, the editor has written at, at length to try to explain the astronomy and the, the mathematics, which, as I say, are quite, quite beyond me. But Eben Ezra was, uh, for his time, very advanced in that. There's even a crater on the moon named for him, for, for Eben Ezra. He traveled with his astrolabe, which was an astronomical uh, uh, instrument as well. And he was um, renowned for his knowledge of astronomy as we'll see in a, when we end an echo of the way in which he was renowned even in later centuries even in the wider society let's take a look at the last selection here the elders of moab and midian with magical devices in hand went to balaam and they came to balaam and spoke to him the words of balak so ibn ezra says with magical devices in hand so shmuel hanagid who lived in granada he died in 1055 from Spain, he calls him Shmuel HaSefaradi, renders the phrase with fees for magic because it says Kasamim Beyadam and he didn't feel that it was reasonable that they took the instruments for like divination in their hands, so he meant the fee for it in their hands. But uh, he rejects that, Ibn Ezra rejects it, we must follow the literal <laughs> sense of the words. The verse is telling us that Balak sent men to Balaam the magician, men who were versed in the occult as was he. And uh, he sent to Bilam like uh, um, occult experts <laughs> so that they would be able to persuade Bilam to come with them. And if Bilam said, no, it's not a propitious time, they would be able to refute him. But what's interesting to me is how he quotes Shmuel Hanagid and many, uh, as he does quote other earlier authorities as well. And here he disagrees with him because he wants to follow closer uh, to the Pshat. Um, Just give you another little example of his uh, um, sharp uh, observations on the commandment not to take an oath in vain in the Ten Commandments. Lo sisa shem Hashem Do not take the name of God in vain. So he says that this sin is very severe, and its severity is intensified by the multiplicity of the transgression. It's a, a sin which a person can commit very regularly, thoughtlessly, and uh, therefore it's extremely severe. He says, one who is accustomed to commit this sin does it on innumerable occasions daily without even being aware of it. And he says, if you reprove him, why did you swear just now? He will swear to you that he did not do so. That's how people... For this sin alone, we deserve to suffer protracted exile and misery. And although he doesn't like moralize all that frequently, but occasionally he does. And you see, 
his humanity there and you see his sensitivity as well to the, the position of the Jewish people uh, in exile. So uh, although he is distinguished for his rigor, for his rationalism, for his, as I said, his interest in the natural science, philosophy, and he's regarded even today as one of the prominent f medieval philosophers <laughs> in the history of philosophy itself. Uh, and yet, to my mind, his religious uh, sentiment and his love for the Torah and his fealty, his faithfulness to Jewish tradition comes through equally as well. just want to end with one last uh, beautiful observation. Um, I don't know that much about poetry. My, my parents, uh, Zuchan al-Muracha, used to like poetry. My mother was an English, English major in a university and um, my father used to recite poetry sometimes. I don't know that much about poetry. But I do know that one of the great Victorian poets was Robert Browning. I think he died in 1889. And one of his famous poems is called Rabbi Ben Ezra. And it is a poem, he was not Jewish, of course. Yeah. It's a poem that was inspired by Ibn Ezra. Now, how he came across Ibn Ezra, I don't know. He never came to my shir even. So how he ever met him, I don't know. But uh, he knew a little bit about him, and he wrote a beautiful poem. Now, the poem is not really about the life of Ibn Ezra or the personality, but it's his interpretation of some of the philosophical principles that Ibn Ezra taught or embodied in his lifetime. And uh, I'm not going to read you the whole poem. You can Google it just like I did easily enough. Um, but I'm going to read you the first two lines, and I suspect that, I don't mean to patronize, patronize anyone here, but I suspect that you will all be familiar with it because the words are very beautiful and very often quoted among the most well-known lines, I think, in all of English poetry, in the, in poetry in the English language, I should say. And it's interesting that despite the vicissitudes of the life of Ibn Ezra and the misfortune, just to remind you, he was penniless. He had five sons, four of them died, the other one converted to Islam, his wife died, he had no home, he had no, no Talmudim, he had no uh, you know, d disciples, he went from place to place and he uh, uh, bemoaned his misfortune and nevertheless he saw life with a certain appreciation. He, uh, he appreciated life and he cherished life and I'll just read you or remind you of the uh, beginning of this poem, Grow old along with me, the best is yet to be. So those words are written by Robert Browning, and they come from this Rabbi Ben Ezra. Grow old along with me, the best is yet to be. Now, uh, to me, that's very, very beautiful. And just as one last closing uh, uh, flourish, uh, the same words, grow old along with me, were a song written by John Lennon. And uh, he never quite got around to recording it properly because unfortunately he was assassinated before, before he got to. But he did compose it and he arranged it and I think it has been released subsequently as well. Um, but it was posthumously. So there you have it from Ibn Ezra to John Lennon <laughs> and in between. Thank you very much.